Welcome back, everyone. We are seeing some new signs of stability in the real estate market, at least in NYC and Manhattan. CNBC's Diana Olek is here right now with a look at more on the surprising new development. Hey, a little good news, Diana. Yeah, I mean, Trish, look, it's an improvement, but it's not exactly a boom. It's just a return to what we used to call a normal market in Manhattan, if there is such a thing. Take a look, if you will. Sales numbers are up around 19% year over year in Q2, although down around 3% from Q1. That's co-ops and condos combined. I want to take a look at co-ops, though, because that's the lion's share of the Manhattan market. Sales are way up, nearly 33% year over year, but specifically in the higher end. That's two, three, and four bedrooms, while the studios dropped. They were 12% of the market in Q2 and 24% a year ago. Two bedrooms went from 26% of the market a year ago to 37% of sales in Q2. What do all these numbers mean? I'm moving to prices and you see where I'm going with this. Prices moved up 11.5% quarter to quarter on co-ops and 23% year over year. The author of the survey, who I think we're about to talk to, tells me the price increases aren't real. It's the change in market share from the first time studio buyer loving that tax credit and taking advantage of super low interest rates to now moving back to the way the market always worked before with the two and the three bedrooms ruling the roost. Now, one other note, the super high end is also bouncing back, and that's thanks to huge discounts. We're talking about 40% peak to trough on the high end. So, you know, when you're considering your $15 million cardboard box in the sky, you're getting it for chump change now, and you're likely paying cash. That's your $15 million. You're down to maybe eight, and that's why sales and prices are coming back there. And one more note, condos, they've really grown grown in sales share, but there's a lot of shadow developer inventory just sitting out there not being counted. That is empty new developments, and a lot of these have those smaller studios and one bedrooms which have seriously lost the share. Trish? Wow. Okay, 23% year over year, though, uh, uptick in price for co-ops. They're saying that's actually what Manhattan normally had? Well, it's not that the shares necessarily. It's it's say again, it's the movement from the one bedroom from the studio apartments up to the two, three, and four bedrooms, and that's skewing the prices. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Diana, stay with us. We want to talk some more here about these recent numbers in the Manhattan market. Is this actually going to be proving out to be a lasting trend, or are we going to see declines moving in once again? Joining me right now, Jonathan Miller. He's president of Miller Samuel, whose firm produced today's report. Also, Dolly Lenz. She's vice chairman with Prudential Douglas Elliman. Um, Jonathan, I'll begin with you. I mean, what's your take? Is this a bit of an anomaly here? Uh, Diana was explaining sort of this transition from one bedroom to bigger apartments that people have been making uh, and that accounting for some of this increase in sales and prices. Uh, is it sustainable? Well, I, I think that we have to look at it as we're coming from an anomaly, going into a more normal distribution of activity. The, the, uh, the market share of, as Diane was saying earlier, uh, studios fell off last year. Entry level, it was all about first-time buyers, entry-level purchasers. Uh, the, the entry level is the first market to come back. The beginning of 2010, we saw a, uh, a, a return of the luxury market, the high end of the market. But the middle of the market, the two bedrooms, smaller three bedrooms, were uh, underperforming. Finally, this quarter, we started to see them return to a normal uh, share of the market. And that's encouraging. Okay, so is it sustainable? Encouraging, uh, but sustainable? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, I'm very skeptical that we don't have some uh, pain, a little bit of pain in front of us simply because unemployment levels are very high, credit is still very tight, and we have that shadow inventory. Still, it's better news than what we've been accustomed to. You know, the Manhattan real estate market, we all know, is like an independent little island. Of course, all real estate, they say, is local. Uh, Dolly Lentz, let me ask you, Jonathan just pointed out that credit's tight, unemployment is certain weak. Uh, and then you have people like uh, Meredith Whitney, banking analyst, often uh, on this show, who's saying that you should brace yourself because things are going to get even worse for employment in the financial sector. What's that likely to do to Manhattan real estate? Well, clearly anything in the under, let's say, $10 million market, it's likely to hurt significantly. 80,000 jobs. I mean, how can you not factor in 80,000 job loss? All of Meredith if it Whitney's, happens. Yeah, all of her predictions, you know, if true, will wind up truly hurting the under $10 million market. Okay, but even if it's not true, what about the psychology of it? Dolly, are people getting worried out there? What are you seeing? I mean, you're, you're, you're around these buyers and sellers every day. What's the psychology like? I mean, the psychology is very negative. I mean, people are very concerned about their jobs again, even financial sector people, which were, which were not concerned until now. 
Even the very wealthy are now getting concerned about bonuses. People are now already starting to talk bonus. And bonus for, for this year is expected to be lower than almost any other year. So all of that does not bode well for the market, let's say the under $10 million market. The over $10 million market, which is what I think is really a lot of the brewing of this report, is still good. Look, we've closed, every deal I've closed over $10 million has been a record sales price. Record. Amazing, but true. A record sales price. And it just shows there are people who don't have to worry about financing and don't have to worry about these other issues, selling another apartment, or what everyone else has to worry about. You know but, Go ahead. Go ahead. Trish, can I, Trish, can I jump in here with just one little bright spot? Because you know me, I'm all about the bright spots. Is we yeah, are right. seeing You're growth all about in the bright <laughs> spots. <Yeah. laughs> well, I don't know about that, Diana, it's but, all, but throw it to are, us. There are investors coming back into the market. We talked to some over this summer. There are foreign investors coming, especially into the condo market, which are helping to put a floor on some of these prices. They're not going for the really high-end apartments, but they're looking to buy in bulk, and that is in, in the mid-range. And that's a good thing to get some of that inventory off the condo market market at least, getting buyers from Eastern Europe, China, Italy even, as a lot of good uh, prospects in that, if you want to see a little bit of a bright side. Hey, Diana, we have a news alert there on the bottom of the screen. Uh, I know you're out in the field, so you can't see it, but you should know Bank of America official, a Bank of America official, is acknowledging uh, that the, the bank routinely uh, would sign foreclosure documents without reading them. Uh, we heard, of course, just the other day from J.P. Morgan saying they were suspending yeah. uh, proceedings on about 50,000 foreclosures. Your take on the Bank of America news and what this really Absolutely is saying about the Absolutely to be expected. Market. You know, we've been going after Bank America all day today and weren't getting any calls back for a while because, and that I expected was because they were coming up with what exactly they were going to say about this. We saw J.P. Morgan come through. Of course, GMAC Ally came up with the same news. We expected to see it from other lenders, Bank of America being the largest of them all, taking on all those countrywide loans. It's not surprising at all. But again, this is going to slow down the foreclosure process, and that is only going to slow housing's recovery. Okay, and I do want to clarify that this is just one official from Bank of America. Um, real quick here, before we go, I want to throw the same question at both Jonathan and at Dolly. Dolly, I live in Manhattan. Uh, should I buy something right now? really depends on your situation. I think it's very, just like real estate is local, it's also very personal. You know, if, if you live in Manhattan, you have a secure job, which, you know, I, I don't know, I guess you'll have to judge that. You have a secure job, you live in Manhattan, you have money, everything is okay, you don't need financing, or you're, or you're able to get the financing. It may be a very good time for you to buy an apartment because prices are low, interest rates are low, and you should be able to negotiate a good deal. Okay, Jonathan, same question to you. Is it an appropriate time for people to consider buying in Manhattan? Well, I agree with Dahlia. It really is personal choice. If you're looking at, I think the problem in the past few years as we looked at real estate, many people looked at it incorrectly as a short-term speculative uh, purchase. Uh, for the long term, I think Manhattan has good fundamentals, but if you're looking to time the market, I don't, I don't see how you can do that. I think if you find something you like, you should probably take it. Got to live somewhere, right? Okay, right. guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it.